I envy you so much. Yeah, I always like I struggle with insomnia. Well, I don't know if often, but enough. Um, by the way, I got to get, you know, welcome to Maple Syrup episode 267, one day sponsored by Sleepy Time Tea. I'm definitely going to have like one time, like, I want to thank our sponsor, you know, blank Sleepy Time. I got to actually admit, guys, everyone watching online later, there is a bidding war to sponsor, sponsor Maple Syrup History. I know it's like not appropriate to talk about money, but this one company that does Sleepy Time Tea, uh, they kind of lowballed me. They're like, what if we gave you a three or $30 million contract? I was like, that's only 10 million a year. Like maple syrup history, you got to think hundreds of millions of dollars. You know what I mean? One day we're going to be like sponsored by Sleepy Time Tea, whoever. Today, that's not the day. For a while, I had a fake sponsor on this channel. Um, I'm dead serious. You look at the older episodes, it was sponsored by Amish buttermilk whipped cream, something like that, which is completely fake at all. And at one point uh, during our first World War lecture, I sang an acapella version of my old Kentucky home and claimed that my sponsors made me do it, but they, they don't exist. So I just did it. Today is, as we said, very, very honored to have Aaron and Brad in class, along with the hundreds of thousands of people watching live right now. <laughs> this is episode number three of our beauty class. What I told them, I'll tell you, tell everyone who watches this later, all of these are on the maple syrup playlist on the channel. So if you miss anything, and, and again, you're always welcome to email me, intellect at manocatholic.com. All right. So this is episode number three of beauty, maple syrup history number 267 in some. And we're focusing on Antonio Gaudi and the Sagrada Familia. Sagrada Familia, of course, is a Catalan word for holy family. The Sagrada Familia is the grand cathedral that Gaudi commenced building in the late 19th century and is still, as of today, as I record this lecture on January 17th, 2024, still not completed, still under construction. Now, I've got eight pages for you today. Now, if anyone knows like the stuff that intellect does, our hippo lectures are 30 minutes. Ironically, in the coolest way, like she's a legend. Aaron Kasperitz, who's in class, is the, is the hippo MC superstar uh, introducer. That's probably a word, I think person who kind of like the master of ceremonies. The Hippo lectures are like 25, 30 minutes, the kind of Catholic topic talks, the catechetical stuff of Father Chase is about 10 minutes. Today, these maple syrup, they're always about an hour. Um, even though the class technically runs an hour and a half, really it's about you know an hour of recording time. And I want to, in that way, right? This kind of like how Christ is the alpha and the omega. And I love that, the first and the last. I want to, in that first and last, start off with points that I'll finish this class with after we've talked about all these things. Um, and you'll understand these one through nine at the end, but I want to begin with them now. To everyone watching, everyone in class, I want to read the nine takeaway points that I could put on the board about Gaudi and the Sagrada Familia. And now you're going to take them in like, oh, okay. And they might make sense immediately depending upon how much you know about architecture and, and this person. I mean, that, that'll be the whole kind of ball game. You might know a lot about Gaudi and a lot about Sagrada Familia as it is. So uh, if that's you, they might make immediate sense. But if not, in the, after the conclusion of our lecture, I'll come back to these nine. Here they are, one through nine. Ready? Number one, beauty for God takes time, centuries even. And sometimes to aim beyond our own life is the best aim. That's point number one. Beauty for God takes time. This class is the beauty class, transcendental, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And when we're talking about this kind of beauty for God, Gaudi's nickname, do you guys know what his nickname was? Anyone? Nickname? Antonio Gaudi, the architect, our, our superstar biographical focus today, architect, designer, genius builder of the Sagrada Familia. What is his nickname? God's architect. That's very, very cool. The man was a devout Catholic. Um, Gaudi is so based, it's unbelievable. Like in the way of like, he, despite being a legendary, he looks like he's a, a homeless beggar. And in fact, to spoil, spoiler alert his biography in a second, he gets hit by a tram crossing the street and dies. And people think he's just some like random homeless guy. I think that bespeaks, I'm not even kidding, like art in the lived sense. Here's a guy of like angelic level, like Fran Angelico, Da Vinci, Renaissance style, style art. He doesn't carry himself like I'm the glossy architect of the man. Like he actually sleeps in the cathedral, like a true architect in the firm, sleeping under his desk, and looks like an absolute bum because he's like, that's that's what's what's what it's about. I love those kind of people. 
Give me the CEO who's first in the Forbes list, but have, wears a grimy hoodie every day. I love that. I love that kind of stuff. That juxtaposition is kind of like a, a contempt for the world, contempt for vanity. Gaudi's like, I'm going to look so grimy in my personal appearance because my art is so awesome. He's just, I love this guy. But point number one, beauty for God takes time, centuries even. And the point here is, anyone ever watch, you know, on HGTV, even like a, anyone watch Chip and Joanna Gaines, ever watch a content? They're great, right? Okay. But even Chip and Joanna, like, and they do again a good job. I'm, I'm neither a fan nor a detractor. Like, they're fine. I, I respect all people of talent. They certainly are. I'm neither a kind of fan nor a, a hater. They get their stuff done pretty quickly. I actually watched the Chip and Joanna games recently when they remodeled some kind of hotel in Waco. And it was done like in three months, which on the one hand is very impressive. But on the other hand, well, it takes three months. How much can you actually do with it? Notre Dame in Paris, who some you know argue is the most beautiful Catholic church in history, takes almost 200 years to build. Because maybe that's what it takes. Maybe if you want to do true transcendental beauty, you got to really go like crazy long game aim. Gaud Notre Dame? Yeah. Notre Dame is built between, ooh, I think the 1100s and the 1300s. Let me check exactly. Betsy Johnson was on the stream. Hello, Betsy. Uh, Notre Dame. I'll give you the exact dates. I know it's 183 years, like 1345. Let me check. I want to give you the real dates. Dom Cathedral. Yeah, I was right. I was right about 1345. Construction starts 1163. This is Notre Dame, not Sagrada Familia. 1163, completed in 1345. Uh, interestingly, 1345 is two years before the Black Plague uh, hits Europe, 1347 to, to 50. 1163 to 1345, 183 years. Yeah, maybe that's what it requires, right? Maybe that's why Notre Dame is so cool because it takes 200 years to build. Construction techniques back then, look what it takes to get to the same Right, 100%. 100%. Uh, not to get too far afield, but the early European design school called Romanesque is basically build churches of the then coming into being Christendom, kind of like Roman aqueducts, very sturdy, kind of dark chocolate, all business. How do you get the higher oh, evolution to uh, the Gothic school and the Baroque beyond that? The uh, Notre Dame obviously being the kind of beau ideal of the Gothic, Rayonant Gothic school, the flying buttresses, those whale ribs that make the walls wider and enable you to do the rose windows. It takes a lot of time. So if you're like, how dare you, Gaudi? You died 1926 and it's still not done? A hundred years later, bruh. No, right? No, he is saying from heaven now. He's saying to us, bruh. He's like, it takes time. Yeah, I mean, like, look at Notre Dame. So, so Gaudi, number one. Number one point. And I've belabored it. I've, I've beat this dead horse too much. But for the final time, these nine takeaway points, Betsy Johnson, you showed up at the exact right time. So I'm starting off with the nine points that I'll close with. Number one, beauty for God takes time. Centuries even and beyond our own life might be the best aim. You want to do something great, aim for like people reading it hundreds of years now. Like you know about my obsession with the divine comedy. That's a great work because it's still with us. Point number two, full commitment, question mark, single, question mark. Is this the best way, like priests, to discharge one's talents? I love married life. I love my wife so much. I, I'm very, very happily married. Who do you recommend marriage to? Everybody. Like, marriage is awesome. But it's, it's an interesting question. Gaudi doesn't marry. He's a bachelor. He lives in uh, the church. Do you think his wife would let him sleep in the church? Brad, do you think his wife would be like, I'm never coming home. I'm just going to chill in the church? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, if we know anything about men and women, she's probably not going to be okay with him at the office all the time. But that, that's an interesting question. Is that how you do great work? Gaudi, I'll read you a quote soon, says, like, I'm married to my work, basically. And he actually elevates it higher. And I'm just ready to do all the work for God and the church. I can't stress this enough. There are some things in this class, topics, we're going to be talking about not Catholics. Like pretty soon, Bo Jackson, the athlete, was not a Catholic. Is not. He's still alive. Um, praise God. May he have a long life. Bo Jackson is not a Catholic. He's a Christian. He's not a Catholic. Gaudi is like on the nose of this class. Not only does he build this most beautiful cathedral, but he himself is very devout and practicing. Well, does that enable him? This point number two, his kind of uh, celibate lifestyle, his not tied down by the by the by the um, 
the obligations of marriage to really let his talent flourish? You know, open question. I promise you in this class, you know, everyone watching later, everyone here, I I'm actually most interested in posing questions. Like, Aaron, what do you think? And then letting you kind of like, that's the, it's not about, well, this is what it is. I don't know. I don't, I don't know myself. Number three, mistaken for a beggar. Who cares? That's good. It's like a burping angel, all the better. Just worry about glorifying God. Burping angel, what are you talking about? There's an episode of Father Brown series. Has anyone seen that on BBC? Father Brown was a series written by G.K. Chesterton. And in this episode, this angel shows up in disguise to this country town in England. And he's so grimy. They think he's like a guy. He's just walking around like so gross. And then at the end, he after this procession, he has the most beautiful heavenly voice. And you realize back through the episode, it's very well done. Oh, wow. He was doing all these things silently. And like the divine humor of God. Here's the grimiest guy. That's how an angel presents as our blessed Lord himself didn't come in grand majesty the first time, but as a helpless baby in a manger. So maybe Gaudi's kind of griminess that I mentioned earlier is kind of cool. It's maybe a lack of pretension, a lack of ego, a lack of showiness. I know a lot of architects whose egos, you know, can't fit through a door. Gaudi's not that. You know, put me on the front of the magazine. I'm the man. No. Number four, apolitical refuses to run for office. He likes Catalonia culture, but not bound to the earth. Barcelona and Catalonia, there's this question of like, I'm so glad you're here as a Texan. Catalonia is kind of the Texas of Spain. Like Texas was an independent country for nine years, between 36 and 45 Gaudi likes that, but otherwise he's not political. Is that a message for Catholics trying to uh, pursue beauty? Don't get bogged down in left and right letter. Focus on the kingdom of God. Once more in those four just quick reviews, because I was really rabbit holing them, but I want to be very kind of precise. Number one, beauty for God takes time. Number two, if you're single, you have that more full commitment to the work of God, as St. Paul himself says, for priests. Number three, mistaken for a beggar who cares. That's kind of cool, the kind of you know, lack of pretense. Number four, does apoliticization lead to rendering more service to God in your talents? Number five, in his love of his native Catalan language and the Benedictine motto of ora et labora, prayer and work, Gaudi lives this great Catholic value of subsidiarity. Subsi There's two great Catholic values of te social teaching, subsidiarity and solidarity. The latter, we all know, you know, we're all Catholics. Christ died for everyone. We're all brothers and sisters in one human family. Subsidiarity means whatever can be done on the local level should. Gaudi doesn't worry about going to New York City or Paris. He's Catalonian. He's there. Maybe it's the question of like, you know, the cliche, bloom where you're planted. Wherever you are, make that the best. Gaudi builds, us, I'm not saying Barcelona is a, a, an unimportant city. It's, it's a very, um, you know, world famous city, but he just happens to be from there. So he builds it there. He's not, oh, I can only do this in London kind of thing. Maybe bloom where you're planted. That subsidiary is one of the differences between socialism and capitalism. Yeah. Capitalism means that subsidiary. Sure, sure. Versus the kind of socialistic, yeah, the kind of Politburo, one faceless bureaucrat leader. Yeah, sure. Uh, point number six, like me, it's true. Gaudi is a lover of tradition and modernity. You maybe even see post-modernity. When you watch this later on, on Maple Syrup History playlist, if you do online, I start the episode with a, a slideshow, about a two minute slideshow showing you what this looks like. And if you're like, you know, I really hate your channel, I'm not gonna watch it. You could just find this online. Just Google Serato Familia. You don't have to watch my stupid channel. Just go look at pictures of the church. It's very weird. It looks like an overturned ice cream cone or like chocolate chip cookie dough. The inside is based on a rainforest. That is good weird. Um, the first episode of this class, Hildegard of Bingen, who said she was super good weird. Like weird and bad is bad, but good weird is cool. Hildegard in her convent allowed her nuns to wear flowers in their hair, <laughs> like Woodstock style. And they still did all their divine office and glorified God. If you're doing things to glorify God, do whatever you want. That's what St. Augustine said. You know, love God above all and do whatever you want. It's some kind of quote, really, in that kind of way attributed to him. Gaudi, it's kind of point number six. He likes traditional school. He likes the Gothic school. He thought Gothic didn't go far enough. And so he made it super weird in this kind of rainforest imitation, very natural. And it's amazing. He's considered, it's not just Catholics. Oh, you, oh yeah, right, dude. You like this guy because he's Catholic. Like, I mean, I do like that about him, but he's just a genius, period. Um, and considered one of the most innovative, daring architects. Can we take a lesson from that as Catholics in our own way? 
to respect tradition, but not be often bound by it. I got to keep all the traditions Holy Mother Church teaches me. But if they're man-made traditions and stupid stuff, maybe you don't have to do it and actually go experiment. You know, I always think about this, like not to wade into these waters of the Latin mass and all that. I would love it if the, 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 the church went back to the Latin mass, all that kind of stuff. I don't think, you know, women should dress like it's 1890. It's not 1890. I mean, you can still have a Latin mass and a communion rail and receiving on the tongue, all things I like. And again, first of all, who cares what I think? But I do like these things. I don't think people should act like it's 1870 and women should dress their husband as sir or spend as some of these like traditional communities. I no thank you. And I think Gaudi agrees with me. I keep the good traditions, find the kind of balance. He really balances traditionalism with modernity in his architecture. Point number seven, like Socrates, left no written documents, just went after it baller style. Yeah, Gaudi just like, he would make models. He'd freestyle design. He didn't found a school once more because he's an absolute bum. I say that in the best way. Like he's an absolute disaster wearing his you know, hoodie. And he's thinking in that moment, like, man, if I had a wife, she'd be on me all the time to get a better wardrobe. Like he's an absolute grimy, grimy guy. And so you think he's going to found a school? So when I cheat, I will say right now, like some of Catholic media is so cringe in the presentation. Gaudi is so anti-cringe. Gaudi's not going to, found a school with it's really polished and really dumb intro music. Gaudi's just so grimy. And like his work, he lets his work speak for itself. And the same way here, he's like, you want to be my student? I imagine you want to go be this guy's student. You have to just go live in the church with him and learn from him. He's like, we're going to do the real work. I imagine a baker who's like, no, I'm not going to give you a fancy diploma from the Culinary Institute of America or have you all's recipe. You can just come chill in the kitchen with me. I'm going to be smoking like a chimney and dip in tobacco, but we're going to make the best creme brulee ever. We're just going to do the actual stuff. So maybe there's a kind of beauty of focusing on what matters and not and avoiding what doesn't matter. My favorite example of this is like, if you ever work out with someone and their gym is really nice, they're not about working out. They probably don't work out at all. But if you find a guy who like is the grimiest basement, like leaky pipes, the guy's probably a monster. You should probably imitate everything he does because he's actually about lifting more weight. He doesn't care about but isn't my isn't the like the picture on the wall nice? He doesn't have to, he can't even read. All he does is just like eat metal. So this is like Joseph Gowdy is just all about the design. It's not about other stuff. Um, number eight, Gowdy's father was a blacksmith. I don't want to go off on some cheesy rant. Oh, the worker, the worker. I'm very white collar for better for us. I have a history PhD, I'm a professor. I'd be the ultimate poser to pretend like, oh yeah, I'm just like, you know, the guy who's the plumber, him and I like. I'm not a blue collar worker for better, or for worse. Like I, you know, I love athletics. And if you consider, you know, doing athletic stuff, like working with your hands, but I, I will never, ever, ever, I'd be the ultimate again, like poser to be like, I'm like a mechanic plumber. I'm not in the trades. And neither was Gaudi. Gaudi is, is like, an, he's an intellectual architect. But what's cool is the same way, like one of my personal heroes, my grandfather, happy memory, he was a mailman. I love the idea of like the mailman, like in the weather today, does the mailman stop? When it's snowy, he doesn't care. He doesn't know what snow is. He delivers the mail. I try to bring this like blue collar attitude to my own work, even though it's very white collar intellectual, because blue collar people really are, are the kind of salt of the earth. You know, they don't complain, they just get it done. Gaudi's father being a blacksmith matters for him as an architect. He's not a pretty boy architect. He's not like, well, blah, blah, blah. He, he does architecture like a blacksmith. You have to just get the job done. You have to go and show up and work. Gaudi is so Catholic, even before we talk about his Catholicism, Catholicism, qua Catholicism, like for its own sake, he's just very Catholic and like, or at labora, local, get the job done, no frills, zero ego, and actually for the love of God. Then point number nine, his Sagrada Familia is kind of like a divine comedy written in stone. I always talk about to design classes and design lectures, history of architecture, this beautiful, it's in my book, The Hippo Lectures, I have a whole art um, chapter called Frozen Music. Frozen Music, you know, what is unfrozen music? Divine comedy written in stone. Sagrada Familia is a divine. I'm not going to review one through nine now because I'll do it at the end of class. I'm already rambling on way too long as it is with these. Um, but once you finish the whole biographical stuff, when we recap, and what's cool too about this class is however long we are will depend upon a lot. Again, Betsy, hello. It's really good to see you. Really good to see you on, online. FYI for everyone before I was joking, there aren't a hundred thousand people watching us, but Betsy Johnson is here. And so as far as I'm concerned, Betsy is greater than a hundred thousand people. Um, 
it'll depend upon who wants to comment and say stuff, whatever you have no obligation to. I love the conversation that we had about like, say this to everyone, you can come for one class or whatever. Same thing here. There's no, there's no participation, right? There's nothing like formal about this class. So we won't actually be too long in covering all this stuff. When we get back, we'll go through one through nine. Let me finish that ninth point. Unfrozen music is normal music. If you hear Gregorian chant, the best of Mozart, you hear in an auditory sense, a literal, like what your ears are made for. Music. Well, architecture, you know, look out the window. Like that church is frozen music. Or our Augustine Center, and you might like that frozen music. I like the song being sung to me from that design, or I'm horrified. I'm horrified by 1960s architecture. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you how to feel about it. It sings a song. And it might be very discordant and off-key and very beautiful. Gaudi's, I will propose and argue. I don't often like to tell you what to think. I think it's very beautiful, the Sagrada Familia. It's a very beautiful frozen music song. And it's so intricate and takes so long, not just because of point number one, that beauty for God takes time, but because um, it's a very complex piece of quote-unquote music. Once again, this guy who's so grimy, so unconcerned about appearances. And again, just like Hildegard was, good weird, he's wholly grimy. He's not like bad grimy. Like there's grimy, yeah, she's not used to the word grimy. Because grimy implies a whole list of things he wasn't. I don't mean grimy as like a skis ball or the way it's used for like someone who's like a, just a bad guy in whatever ways. I mean grimy like he would walk around, best I could put like a, a hoodie ridden with holes, hasn't shaved in 600 years because he's only concerned about this, you know, beautiful piece of music that he's making. All right. Let's go through the list. I have all my sheets. If you want to know who I'm inspired to by having like lecture sheets, the late great Latinist, Father Reginald Foster, Brad in a previous class should do an interview with him. You might remember he was a, a priest in Milwaukee. He was the Pope's official translator. Uh, Father Foster, <laughs> look him up, Father Reginald Foster, Latin. Again, he translated every, he's a, he's a plumber's son, first of all, so based, like check mark, done. I'm, I'm in love. He's a son of a plumber. Like he's already legit. Priest from Wisconsin, who an American guy. P.S. He's from Wisconsin, um, American Dairyland, and he's in the Vatican. And he's the official translator for every document. Like he, the Pope John Paul II's funeral mass, all this kind of stuff. He comes back to Milwaukee and he teaches a class. And he's like, I don't care what you do in my class. He's like, you can drink beer. He's like, you just can't make mistakes. It was hilarious. And all the students, of course, they just like CBS News special on him. All students loved him. They would take him out to like, he's just a total legend. He died, God rest his soul. Uh, older man, maybe close to 90 years old. I mean, maybe, maybe we all have that kind of life. To make a long story short, he always had these awesome notes. He would just have like sheets. So if you're like, am I copying that? I'm trying to, I'm trying to copy that style. Betsy Johnson writes here, she has three comments. No, Betsy, I'm not going to read them. I'm not interested. I just saw it's too much. Um, <laughs> Betsy writes, his work is interesting and has great beauty. But I take issue with the earthiness of his work. In some ways, it makes me think of fall nature rather than bringing my mind to contemplating the perfection of God. Second quote, second comment. It makes me think of toadstools, roots hanging over a rabbit hole below a tree, and an ankylosaurus. Third quote. It also makes me think of crystals growing with imperfections. Betsy, I always say, people, fans of maple syrup history know Betsy Johnson is like an epic component of maple syrup history and has wonderful comments and she's continuing this tradition that's a wonderful critique critique thank you that is a very good critique of Gaudi I I happen to take the opposite point of view I love the earthiness of his work I find it just intoxicating but you're right that is a very good critique you might say it's almost I wouldn't say disrespectful but it's like well do you want to walk into a cathedral and think of toads and the forest you know is it not the, the Chartres cathedral elevate the spirit more do I want to think? That's a beautiful quote you wrote at the end. Crystals growing with imperfections. Maybe I want the lack of imperfect. I want perfection in my cathedral space. I, again, respectively, uh, you know, disagree with you. I love it. I love Gaudi. But that's that's a that is really a very intelligent, good critique. If there is a really good critique of him, it's what you just wrote right there. That's your eyes. Comment number four: intoxicating like fairyland. Yeah, I love that. I, and I'm not a huge fan of fantasy in general. Uh, yeah, just period. But like. To go and to walk into Sagrada Familia and feel like I've entered a fairyland, Alice in Wonderland, upside down. Chesterton in Orthodox, he talks a lot about like just the concept of fairyland in an abstract philosophical sense of like where the grass is black and 
or whatever. And he, 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 in his critique, he talks about it. even there, like the grass would remain green, but it's something like uh, <laughs> candles are like bleeding from the sky. It's amazing. It's amazing imagery that I'm completely not doing justice to at all. So I like that kind of intoxicated, wow, Gaudi is messing with my senses, feeling. And when you see the video later, if you do, which all four of you, there was no reason to, you saw it live. But if you see anyone sees the recording, like, in, or people watching on, online now in the future when it's posted have seen the recording, I open with the shot of the outside. It looks kind of like the overturned chocolate chip cookie dough. And the interior is looking up towards like the tree canopy. So Betsy, I mean, you're spot on. We just happen to disagree that I, I find it perfect. And I wish more churches were like that. But if there is a critique to offer, it's yours. It's very well said. Uh, Gaudi's dates of life. He's born in 1852, dies in 1926. So he's not old. He dies at age 74. He's still you know, relatively young. If you want to say you know, like an older person is like over 90, he's not super old, but he's also not, he's not young. He's not you know, 40, whatever. I'm just going to list, like I had nine board points that we're going to finish with. I'm just going to list, I literally have star or uh, arrows of just like, this matters. You take notes how you want to or don't, or do whatever you want, but with no numbers, just kind of straight through. First thing to kind of know about him. His work was influenced by some kind of combination of these three things, architecture, nature, and religion. I wholeheartedly agree. To say an architect was influenced by architecture is disgusting. <laughs> the water is influenced by water. What's the first quality of snow? Snowfall. I mean, the arch go ahead, Brad, yeah? Well, as I say, I thought you were talking about that confused. I thought you were talking about the architect that did the Notre Dame. I'm not. No, we're done with Notre Dame. Uh, thank you, because you're right. I mentioned a lot about it. I'm not. I'm Who did Notre Dame? Uh, that I'm not even. I don't know if there it was a principal architect on that pro, on that thing. I know that like some of the stained glass guys were like great grandfather. It was really cool. The people that finished this in 1345 were like, oh my great great grandfather in the 1200s. And there's a lot of, kind of family lineage that way. I'm not sure if there's one principal kind of like on site principal architect. The idea of the star architect, the construction manager, are very modern kind of inventions. I only mentioned Notre Dame though, and I'm glad you mentioned it again because. You can say the Sagrada Familia is the modern Notre Dame. Same scope, same grandeur. And again, maybe Betsy Johnson is 100% correct. Maybe it's too much thinking about, you know, imperfections in the natural world. It's too earthy, but it's very much like the Notre Dame of our times. And we're, we get a front seat, front row seat to see it. It's not completed yet, right? Okay. Uh, he's, he's influenced by architecture. Cool, dude. I mean, he's an architect. But nature and religion, yeah. I want to just briefly say... Gaudi, and we'll see this in the naturalism of the space, he's very influenced by nature. And religion is not a throwaway point. Gaudi, at one point in his life, takes a class on Gregorian chant. Gaudi takes a class from Vandal Catholic on Gregorian chant. Like he's involved in like his local parish. He's a serious Catholic. Do I consider people that are cultural Catholics Catholics? I do. You know, I can't judge someone, but we can definitely say there's a difference between someone who's like, well, I'm, you know, my faith story is kind of complex, but I still identify as Catholic versus someone who's got daily mass for. And Gaudi's the latter. Gaudi's on fire for his faith. So combining his Catholic faith and that Catholic imagination alongside his love of the natural world is basically, I mean, a, this is a basic class. There's times with all the information, I'd be like a low-level grad school, might be an upper-level undergrad. It's not, it's still not like, it's supposed to be kind of an introduction to a lot of themes. That's a pretty good introduction to Antonio Gaudi. An architect of second point of the modernista movement, modernism, especially Catalan modernism. An architect of the Catalan modernist movement, of course, is very influenced by the European architectural tradition, especially the Gothic school who wants to surpass the Gothic, whose driving two points are art, are our nature and religion, his personal Catholic faith and his love of nature. That's he writes, being influenced by architecture means that he hasn't totally thrown out the value of others' contributions. Sure. Thank you again. That's a good corrective too. You're right. That, that, that can be not so much, you know, architect architecture. It means right that he's still responding to the, the train of this larger European system, which whether you implied this or not, the implication is hilariously true. That's a lot of modern architects don't do that. Sadly, they're just like, no, screw everything. I'm just going to put there recently a guy duct taped a banana to the wall and sold for $250,000. Even more bold. And my respect for this guy is infinite. This Italian uh, designer sold an imaginary sculpture. 
and flipped out on his client. And he's like, you paid $20,000 a year. Talk about how to say I'm a moron without saying I'm a moron. Then buy a $20,000 imaginary sculpture. But the, it, it actually, it was even stupider. <laughs> the guy, I mean, the architect's the legend because he didn't do any work without $20,000. Guys, come tonight to hear my imaginary story. <laughs> Hundred dollar top chart. I mean, it's that's hilarious. But these kind of guys. Um, but to finish the story, he flipped out that the person who bought his imaginary sculpture wasn't installing it properly. <laughs> like I'm not even. Kidding. Aaron, it has to be five by five feet. There. Do you not see what I told you when you bought? You signed like thirty paper stacks. It's absolutely absurd. So Betsy's right. That like Gaudi. No, Gaudi does respect the tradition, unlike a lot of modern people. Excuse me, postmodern people. Uh, Gaudi's nickname, next point, yeah, right, is God's architect. That probably says it all. Has led to his call for beatification. <laughs> Why am I laughing? I hope he's beatified because of the, the absolute cringe level commentary about Gaudi's uh, beatification process. So someone wrote about this. They're like, uh, he should be beatified, but they need miracles for this. You got me right there. Check, check, check. I agree. God bless Holy Mother Church. I love being Catholic for this reason of, you know, to become, uh, uh, you know, beatified, you need the proof of God's stamp of approval. Anyone hear about the nun, the incorruptible body recently? Yeah, Th that seems to be right. I would say, do you agree? Like God has done something there. It's cool. It's not normal. Gaudi, as far as you know yet, maybe it'll materialize. There have been no miracles associated with him, but without being facetious or sarcastic, I mean, his life is a beautiful miracle of the work rendered to God. We need supernatural kind of healing miracles. So the guy should stop there, his commentary. Like, he's God's architect, I agree. But to be actually be beatified, to be saint, or in the first even just venerable, et cetera, the whole process, he needs miracles. But the guy actually wrote, but, but concerns have risen about his temperament. He was kind of mean or something. <laughs> okay, that doesn't apply at all, right? <laughs> There's a lot of really mean saints, a lot of, like, really mean, like, some nuns like reputed for like they would flip out on the other nuns and i made the whole comment holy here like him being mean epic fail the second was there's questions that he might have used hallucinogenic mushrooms and the cringe commentary was but we don't know he liked mushrooms a lot they must have been hallucinogenic dude just just like delete your blog <laughs> you know like so he liked a lot of mushrooms no evidence i'm just gonna imagine you know this is the dumbest commentary of all time so i had to include that because to show you how bad the commentary was Let's eliminate the back end of that, him being mean and the mushrooms. He's God's architect. We can agree he did this beautiful work for God. We can't call him an, a saint to the church if she pronounces he's worthy of that title because of miracles. That's a whole other ballgame, right? In 1899, Gaudi joins the St. Luke artistic circle. Aaron, can we get this going at Vandal Catholic? We just like found a chapter of the St. Luke artistic. This is super cool. Age 47. Uh, yeah, we're all of us, you know, Oh, why can't we start this now? It's not 1899. Who cares? Uh, he also joins the Spiritual League of Our Lady of Mont Montserrat. It's another kind of Catholic organization in Catalonia. Um, quote, the conservative and religious character of his political thought was closely linked to the defense of his cold identity of Catalan people. Um, Gaudi refused to comment on Donald Trump, though, end quote. Uh, <laughs> that part is not true. Gaudi dies in 1926, guys. 1926, yeah, like third, 20 years before Trump was born. But Gaudi probably will be asked, what do you think of Trump? Because, I mean, Gaudi's this Catholic guy, he's conservative, so what do you, are you for or against Trump? You know, Gaudi would probably say, I, I have no idea, right? We'll just be guessing. I'd like the guy on the blog, assuming things about him, I don't know. But he was very kind of uh, conservative politically, deeply religious. But what I like about him, because I'm not going to tell you how conservative or liberal I am, really, I'm serious. I've said many times in this class, I really just identify as Catholic. I want my Catholic values to influence how I see the kind of body politic and all that. So it's actually like, that's actually the truth. Like, I really am not that political. Anyways, this is getting off into a rabbit hole. I like that about Gaudi too. Of like, he's conservative, but like conservative in the way of like, it's for the Catholic family and prayer. He really was, I just care about the word, right? And that was one of the main points. Listen to what Gaudi says after suffering a bunch of tragedy in, in the 1910s. Um, his niece dies, his main collaborator dies. There's an economic crisis. One of his best friends is Bishop Yosef Toras and Bajes, this Bishop of Vic, dies. Gaudi says, quote, my good friends are dead. I have no family and no clients. 
no fortune nor anything. Now I can dedicate myself entirely to the church. Gaudi is not saying, poor me, poor me, poor me. And may God comfort the sorrowful, how beautiful, you know, the, the Beatitudes and those who are now, you know, mourn will, will rejoice, right? I'm not making light of this at all. God bless him. What I'm saying is what a beautiful Catholic attitude. He's not like, my friends are dead, everything's dead, so I'm going to go do a bunch of drugs. You know, he's like, okay, so so now, and he's like, you know, I don't have a wife, I don't have a family, I'm going to live at the cathedral. He does. Sagrada Familia goes through a lot of sketchy stuff, like the terrible Spanish Civil War in the 30s after he's already dead. You know, the, the world war is kind of being put to the side, and but it's Gaudi's constant vision, this Socrates figure who doesn't write anything, that keeps it afloat. I encourage you guys and everyone, Bessie, you know, everyone in class, everyone later on, go go watch like a documentary about Sagrada Familia. It's really cool. Um, in this class, I hope Maple Syrup History does provide an essential service of like, man, this is cool. Like these historical takes that no one else does. I think Maple Syrup History, for better or for worse, is unlike anything else online. You know, it might be absolute garbage, but it's still different or it's really good. But it is, I, I'm giving you a take on historical stuff unlike anyone else. I can't do as good of a job on like a beautiful photo, National Geographic documentary or Sagrada Familia, obviously. I'd encourage you to go on YouTube and find one of those. It's because of this attitude of Gaudi, this Catholic attitude, where everyone's gone, well, now I'm totally dedicated to God. It would not be inappropriate to say Gaudi becomes almost like an artistic monk at this time, right? He's totally dedicated to God. He dedicates his last year, last, last years of his life to what he called the Cathedral of the Poor. Sagrada Familia, Familia literally means Holy Family, Our Lord, Our Lady, um, and St. Joseph, the Holy Family. But uh, cathedral, he envisions that. It's like, you know, again, he's one of the people. He's a very blue collar, son of a blacksmith type guy. And in fact, he takes up alms at time to fund this. This is so boss. Alms is an A L M S, right? Prayer, fasting, and alms giving, these, these three pillars of life. Gaudi's like, I'll finance this bad boy with arms. <laughs> and they're like, uh, yeah, I don't know what they say to him. In fact, I don't know. They give him, they give him the alms. <laughs> Maybe that was part of his appearance. Like, I need money. And they're like, oh, you look like you need some cash, man. <laughs> Use it for whatever you want. And he's like, well, don't mind if I do. Uh, in addition to being part of the St. Luke Artistic Circle and the Spiritual League of Our Lady of Montserrat, in 1916, like I said before, he takes a Gregorian chant class. <laughs> that is so freaking awesome. <laughs> that is so awesome. Is no one is so pumped about this as I am? Betsy has another comment here. Yes, an architect tries to be completely original with no influence on their architecture, we want to avoid. Maybe. Betsy, I'm going to have a class. I have four beauty classes, four architectural beauty classes. We are going to write a love letter to postmodern architecture in this class, which I hope a lot of Augustine comes out for and hates me for it. So I'm going to be showing, like, this is a rusted carburetor rotting in Akron, Ohio. It's beautiful. <laughs> so we're going to look at some of the crazy stuff you're saying to avoid later. But you're right. Like Gaudi has a very kind of like <laughs> Gaudi has. I want to sing a song right now so bad. <laughs> I really do. I just want to burst in the song right now. <laughs> I just want to just go for it. Brad, would you join me? My car. I make artistic carburetors at rust. That's my contribution. That's what I do. I have re 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 rustable. They rust, go back to normal, and then re rust. That's the trick. So, all right. So, <laughs> anyways, guys. Yeah, good, good. That's what I'm. That's what I'm going for. Gaudi is considered the kind of grand master of Catalan modernism. Now, really quickly, modernism, and Betsy will like this in its earlier stages, was inspired by historic architecture. It pushed back against the very kind of like, uh, I don't want to use the same word twice, but I will purposely, the industrial forms of the Industrial Revolution. The kind of very, what we talk about with like mid-century exposed beams and pipes, which I find insanely beautiful. I really do. Like exposed plumber's pipes, like that's artwork. I love that kind of stuff. But it's like, it is too much tech, too much smokestack, Manchester, Catalan modernism wants to push back against that. And the use of older styles represents for some of these designers kind of a moral regeneration. Gaudi looks at himself as doing a kind of moral project. How Catholic of him. You know, like, okay, I have this, what John Paul II would later call, what? What would John Paul II call, call this? 
the blank to blank, the blank blank to blank or blank, I don't know. The universal call to holiness. Like, you know, uh, bring Christ to all corners. Pope Francis talks about, you know, going to the peripheries. Like Catholics was like, you know, involved in everything kind of. So Gaudi, I mean, a lot of the modernist architects are not religious at all. They're very secular. Gaudi happens to be a devout Catholic. He wants to uh, use some of these classical forms. So some of these, you want to hear some of these features of modernism? This um, romantic language, which tends toward lyricism and subjectivity. What the heck does that mean? I don't mean romanticism like The Notebook. Oh, that's a great movie. Ryan Gosling and uh, what's her name? What is, the, what is the female lead in The Notebook? Rachel McAdams. They're both a good-looking couple. They're both Canadian. I mean, it's very positive stuff. Uh, I don't mean like a rom-com chick flick. Romanticism as in actually our next beauty lecture, where the last great classical composer is Mozart, speaking to your head. Romanticism is about emotivism, emotion speaking to the heart. Modernism speaks to the heart. Here, this example of Catalan modernism, it's a romantic tend towards lyricism, you know, beautiful language, subjectivity. Subjectivity, not like the objective science of kind of classical, you know, where everything is one plus two equals three, whatever. Uh, and there's a lot of use of new materials and a strong sense of kind of optimism, progress. Gaudi retains all these kind of things. But please note, this is the most important thing I'll tell you all day you know, from a design standpoint. Remember, Romanesque is stuff like, you know, churches and uh, uh, castles built like aqueducts, Gothic. Remember the acronym HLB, higher, lighter, brighter. Gothic becomes thinner walls, flying buttresses, higher, you know, vaults and these beautiful rose windows. And then the Baroque goes nuts. Baroque is like multimedia, crazy in your face. Um, the clustered columns we already see in the Gothic school to the max, everything in your face. Lots of color, like color like we see in the Renaissance. Um, Gaudi thinks that despite all the beauty of the Gothic school, it doesn't go far enough. How dare you, you might say, to this quote. For Gaudi, the Gothic style was, quote, imperfect. Take that, Betsy Johnson, quote, Antonio Gaudi. Uh, he's like, despite, he's like, despite the beauty of the, of the, of the Gothic, it's not perfect. I got to include the stuff, and I'm being sincere here, Betsy, I don't mean to kind of overcompliment you, really, the beautiful criticism Betsy had, that that's what he believes I have to do to the Gothic school. The very kind of earthiness, toadstool stuff that perhaps some find, well, it's not raising my spirit like I like. Gaudi's like, that's exactly what Gothic needs. So like, we're done. And I'm being sarcastic, probably have like you know, 10 more minutes. But if that's all you get, Gaudi, a classic architect, but in this modernistic towards the romantic school style, retaining the tradition in some ways, liking Gothic, but believing it doesn't go far enough and trying to perfect it by the, his dual nodes of his own personal devout Catholic faith and the love of nature, then you understand kind of what he was trying to do. Gaudi found abundant examples of beauty in the way God made things. This is super cool. Gaudi said there is no better structure. Guys, listen, I'm going to go nuts. I'm going to start flipping out right now. It's such a great point. There is no better structure than the trunk of a tree or a human skeleton. Aaron, stop talking about like AI. Your hand, the way it's designed, the way God made it, is the most complex, coolest thing. That's what Gaudi would say. Aaron, stop talking about your Nikon camera or whatever. Your eye, the way your eye works, the way God made it, is way more complex. If that's what you think, if you think that nothing beats God's creation, that's Gaudi. So Gaudi, the earthiness of his cathedral, is like, I just want to do what God did. Why would I do a cathedral in a way that's like man with his dumb stone and stuff? I'm going to make it like tree trunks because God did that. I mean, Gaudi is an absolute legend. He loved the catenary arch as well. The catenary arch, C-A-T-E-N-A-R-Y, which is right when you hold a string, like in the midpoint, it'll fall in a certain way and perfectly balanced. A great example of this is the gateway arch in, in St. Louis. Example of this, and he's going to have this all throughout the Sagrada Familia. Um, Gaudi conceived the interior of the church as if it were a forest with a set of, quote, tree-like columns divided into various branches, and they support the structure of these intertwined hyperboloid vaults. Um, Gaudi looks at his, style, at his style as a, quote, rational, structured, logical solution, but in imitating God's design, something that creates, in its originality, a kind of, I can't believe it was there all along, we didn't see it. Gaudi asks us to say, why have we built stuff away from the way nature has built them? 
And by nature, we mean, of course, nothing more than the handmaiden of God. As St. Francis of Sisi would call her, not mother, but sister nature, right? We're all God's creation. God is in charge. And God has made these beautiful things. It should be, uh, you know, in this way, in, in the way that kind of conforms to the natural built environment. And, and excuse me, not, not the built environment. The built environment is what we do as humans, the natural created environment of the kind of natural. He's all about imitating that. Betsy writes, uh, what about these modern stations of the cross? I'll have to look at those modern stations of the cross. You know how like in Meg Ryan, Betsy, um, and Tom Hanks and You've Got Mail, there's that quote, you had me at hello. Like Meg Ryan or Tom was like, I fell in love with you when you said hello, first word. You had me at gross at modern stations of the cross. I'm probably going to hate them. Like, I don't have to, modern stations of the cross, probably F. Right? No matter what, it's going to be fail. I very much love, especially even in the constructions too, the St. Alphonsus Liguori classic stations with the Stabat Mater sung in Latin or English. They're both great. You know what I don't like? When stations of the cross have a 15th station. There's no, there's 14 stations. <laughs> so I'm probably going to hate it, Betsy. Betsy writes, are the imperfections we find in nature due to the fall? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I, this would be a great theological question for someone like to, to go find this in Thomas Aquinas. Did all of nature suffer the effects of the fall? Um, I know we did as rational creatures. We have the original sin that clouds our judgment, you know, the concupiscence as it's called, right? Are trees worse since the fall? I don't know. Or are they exactly as beautiful? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that theologically. Um, okay. This new constructional technique allowed Gaudi to achieve his greatest architectural goal. Pure swagger. Just kidding. Too bad. Too bad. His new architectural goal. <laughs> that is good, though. That is good. I want to do that in real lecture. I'm going to say it. Wait, I'm going to do this seriously, right? Imagine you guys are so awesome. Gosh, you guys are the coolest people, really. I mean that everyone at Augustine. It sounds so grossly like, but I really mean it. I love everyone at Augustine. Everyone is a very good natured person. But imagine it like a very like serious conference, you know, whatever. I want to read this. This is how I read it, right? The new construction technique allowed Gaudi to achieve his greatest architectural goal, pure swagger. Swagging all day, he said, I'm sorry to flex on you guys so hard. JK, LOL, not sorry. <laughs> I'm like, I would love to read that. Like, in that one. <laughs> the new style allowed Gaudi to achieve his greatest architectural goal, to perfect and go beyond the Gothic style. Gaudi, as you already know, wanted to use religion and nature, and his very devout, on fire Catholic faith, to make the Gothic style better than it even was. He's like, it's really good. Don't misunderstand me. But if we return it to its kind of natural beauty, and Betsy, I'm not kidding. I love that there's a kind of disagreement here. Like you're saying a lot of the natural stuff lowers the idea of sanctity. He says it, it elevates it. Uh, but look at like really cool things, even in the intersection between these vaults, where Gothic vaults have ribs. The hyperboloid style allows for holes. So Gaudi uses these to give the impression of a starry sky. So cool. It's, I think that's amazing. But Betsy, again, you might be like, I don't like the idea of an outdoor church. And that's a very fair critique. I want to have the enclosed ribbed vault, barrel vault of the kind of, okay. I mean, that's, this is where I'm not trying to be agreeable. It really is a, you know, preference type point. Uh, Gaudi used to, you know, make little models of things. Hey, you are, you are live on Maple Syrup History. <laughs> How are you? Are you, can I, should I go get the boys early? What do you think with the snow? Okay, because, er, okay. Okay, that sounds, no, I'll see you then, okay? All right, see ya. Um, yeah. I know, right? Um. <laughs> I Brad, <laughs> you and your wife have to do a, um, a class on like um, on just like the relations between men and women, right? How long? How long? How long have you guys been married? Yeah, that's long enough. See, there are some young women. There are some. There are some young women um, on Matt Frad, and she was given relationship advice. I was like, wow, because she's like, you know, I'm 23. Okay, that's that's fail. And she's like, <laughs> and she, Matt Brad proceeded to ask her like about relationships. And I'm like, am I the only one? Like, not, like I don't get this. Yeah, you have to have like 40 years in the bank. 40 years in the bank, you should just tell people, you guys should both blow up and like, it should be like half advice, half roast. 
like where half is pure advice, half is like, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the phone is electronic joke chain. That is hilarious. That is really good. <laughs> that's like a sitcom episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. That's really good. That's very funny. Um, okay, so where was I? Okay, uh, Gaudi, once more, his main point is to surpass the Gothic style, to simply take what is good in the Gothic style and push it forward. Um, like beyond the bounds of kind of the, you know, what, what was you know, normally expected or et cetera. And if you want to overall, if you're like, look, I'm a secular person listening to maple syrup history. Uh, I'm not yet Catholic. Uh, I'm, I'm considering perhaps, but I don't you know. Just tell me what is like the non-Catholic view of Gaudi? Well, kind of just in, in, in uh, architecture writ large, it's impossible to see him apart from his Catholic faith. If you're like, what's the secular view of King Louis the Ninth of France? Well, he's a Catholic king. I mean, you got to talk about his Catholicism. But even people who aren't as enamored of his faith as I am, he's considered in architecture just kind of this creative genius who, inspired by nature, makes and breaks like his own rules, develops a true style of his own. In fact, here's the great architectural take takeaway. Gaudi wanted to go beyond the Gothic. He ended up going beyond Catalan modernism, kind of making it it's his own, even unintentionally. His whole goal might have been just to surpass the Gothic. He creates an own school all into itself. All right, guys. Yeah, that's okay. That's about it. I mean, that's really all I have for you before I read the kind of final points again. If you want some kind of high points to the church, and this class is on, that's Gaudi's life. Remember, he's hit by a bus. I think it's an awesome way to go out. Like recently someone said, and again, no, seriously, you prayed at last class, St. Sebastian praying for, for you know, a good death, and St. Joseph prayed for a good death. May, may God grant it to all of us, God willing that we all die in a state of grace. And there is no comedy here. This is all very, very serious. We all die in a state of grace, hopefully in an old age, surrounded by family, et cetera, et cetera. Praise God. So I hope all that was in place. I have no reason to assume it wasn't. The guy was at a church all the time when he wasn't architecting and designing, he was in mass. Like what I'm saying is the kind of like absolute like bloop kind of end to his life, the lack of fanfare is so Catholic. Recently, Bill Belichick of the New England Patriots, you guys know who that is? Bill Belichick is the head coach of the New England Patriots. One of the greatest coaches of all time, regardless if you think, oh, it's all Tom Brady was his quarterback. When Tom Brady, the very famous athlete, won all the Super Bowls. And people are like, oh, you know, uh, uh, what you Belichick just rode Brady's coattails. He still won all the Super Bowls. And Brady retired. Belichick this year and the Patriots were epic fail. Like they actually lost to Moscow High School. Uh, <laughs> they had a really, they had a really bad season. They're like three and thirteen. And the last game, Belichick lost to the Jets, which, again, I'm showing my football nerddom here. Like, you don't lose to the Jets. They legit suck. And, like, the Patriots were always good. Belichick loses the Jets and goes out the field. That's the football version of just getting hit by a bus anonymously by Gowdy. And I love it. I think it makes Belichick's legacy even cooler. It's like, here's this awesome coach, and he's not going to give you what you want. He's not going to allow you to come and, like, rub his shoulders. You're so great. Party. He's going to go out with a loss. He walked off with, like, a hood over his face. It was hilarious. I love that about Gaudi. He's not going to allow you to fet him, to throw him a party. He's like, no, I'm actually dead. You know, like, <laughs> and just my church remains. And it's like, I truly pray. And let's pray for Gaudi's soul. And I hope whenever I pray for the dead, I've gotten this habit of like praying for the dead, but then wondering like, hey, if you guys are in heaven, pray for us. I mean, I hope we can say, you know, everyone who is in heaven is a saint. Saint, saint Antonio Gaudi, pray for us. Even if there hasn't been a you know, miracle, if he's in heaven, he's a saint. How awesome would that be if you know, he dies and like, well done, my good and faithful servant. And it's like, all of it is so perfectly hilarious. He's saved, he's in heaven. It was great. And he left us his work. And it's an ultimate like last joke on the people. <laughs> I lived my life as an absolute bum on purpose with the greatest artistic talent and died like, ha ha ha, with no one even knew. <laughs> I didn't even know I was dead. <laughs> like I just left the party. Where is he? He's gone. Like, it's so funny. So Gaudi is an awesome, awesome kind of figure. Very much, very much loved this guy. I'm going to read you rapid fire some church stuff here. 1883, he takes over the project. 1885, Chapel of St. Joseph inaugurated first mass is held. This, by the way, is a timeline designed by this man, Francesco, Francisco de Paula de Villar, on sagradafamilia.org backslash en English. Although my Spanish is better than my English, I still decided to do it in English. Uh, backslash history. Um, Brad, if you're wondering how good my Spanish is, yeah, it's pretty good. 
You know, I'm always, people always are asking me like, you know, are you from Colombia? And I'd be like, no, you know, I'm American. <laughs> 1891, work begins on the Nativity facade. 1914, Gaudi starts working on the church, nothing else to remainder of his life. Uh, 1925, St. Barnabas Bell Tower Nativity facade is completed. 1926, Gaudi dies. And his disciple, Dominic Surgenus, takes over the project. 1952, staircase nativity facade is built. Facade is lit up for the first time. Um, 1954, a foundation laid for the passion facade. 1976, bell towers and passion facade completed. 1978, construction means, I'm just kind of like drone reading this, but I mean, you see like all these parts. Remember, once more, right? This is the original design, okay? Um, and by the way, let me completely go back to the beginning in my in my <laughs> in my combination of both joy for this <laughs> this lecture and my ridiculous sidebars francisco de paul de viar is the original architect who lays the kind of the foundational plans gaudi takes over and makes it his thing francisco de paul de viar i want to apologize if i meant to imply that he is the guy who did sagradafamilia.org he is not the runner of the website <laughs> Francisco de Paula de Villar is the original designer. He's the diocesan architect, okay, who in 1882, when this is first designed, um, has the kind of guidelines for the thing, these neo-Gothic elements of the Ogaval windows, buttresses, flying buttresses, the pointing, pointed bell tower, whatever. However, he's off the project within a year, right? Technical differences led this architect to be replaced with another. Who is that guy? It is our man, Gaudi. But let's give credit where credit's due. God bless Francisco de Paula de Villar. He's the guy who breaks the ground, and he's the guy who, who starts the thing off. That's no small thing. Total props to him. But Gaudi, remember, takes over in 1883. All this can be read at sagradafamilia.org. When I was saying before about me drone reading these dates, just please understand, 1882, it starts groundbreaking. The next year, 83, Gaudi is in. 1986, work on the foundation of all the names. Uh, 2005, the nativity facade and crypt are named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 2010, Pope Benedict XVI consecrates the basilica for religious worship. But even as, as a minor basilica, masses are being held. 2016, construction begins on the Tower of the Evangelists. 2018, the cross is finally placed on top of the pediment of the Passion facade. So this is ongoing now for you know three centuries late 19th, all the 20th, and the 21st. I didn't even mention all the kind of hiccups with the Spanish Civil War, and I don't have all the time to go into all the detail. I entitled this lecture Sagrada Familia and Antonio Gaudí. My speaking, my kind of uh, uh, rhetorical whatever, the, the kind of just the, this, the presentation of the material, the lecture, has been almost all Gaudí. The slides you'll see from the maple syrup episode are um, all about Sagrada Familia. All about the actual, you know. Okay. Um, some aspects of it may only be finished by as late as uh, 2040. So people are still saying, people originally thought, I think they wanted to have this grand opening by 2025. Not going to happen. Grand opening isn't a kind of finished deal. Everything, everything in place, no more construction. All right, guys, I'm going to let you all have the final words, but now I'm going to read one through nine again, and it's going to make much more sense, right? And I'm going to read it with no rabbit hole, no jokes, no nothing. Number one, beauty for God takes time, centuries even, and to aim beyond our life is the best aim. Number two, do you have a more, more of a full commitment if you're single to focus on your work? Number three, mistaken for a beggar who cares. This is good. All the more to glorify God, less ego. Number four, if you're apolitical, does that enable you once more to focus more on things of God? Number five, his love of the Catalan language or a labora, subsidiarity. Should you blossom where you're planted? All right, that kind of idea. Number six, combining traditional with modernist touches, best of all worlds always. Number seven, like Socrates, he left no written documents, just went after a straight baller style. Remember, his, this all do one round. His whole plan was maximum swag, right? Number eight, his father's a blacksmith, so he continues this tradition. And number nine, it's the divine comedy written in stone. Sagrada Familia is this beautiful epic, way beyond my life. Once more, to use the word, epic is like Homeric epic. Dante level, epic poems, 
in frozen music dedicated to the love of God. That's all I have. Betsy Johnson, do you have anything else you want to add? Betsy Johnson, are you planning on coming to the Hippo Lecture tonight despite the weather? Or are you like, I have nothing going on. And if it was toy sunny, I'm not going. I hate your guts. Do you have that kind of comment? What do you think about the Hippo Lecture tonight? Positive, no. How are you feeling about it? Probably not. Betsy says, probably not. I respect that. And then Betsy writes other stuff about other things family has to do. And you know what I say? I want all my fans to be like, I care about you above family. That's what I want. I want people to be like, my grandma had to get picked up from the nursing home. She's still there. I had to come to the hippo lecture. <laughs> this guy waits on me to do blank, but a hippo lecture was on. So I told him I got to get my hippo on. I sent him an emoji of a hippo crossing a river. And that's what I was doing. He got, he got it. He's going to be waiting there for a long time. I bust that. Betsy, well, you know, this is awesome that you can, I'm definitely going to post Chernobyl on the Palouse to the channel later. So everyone can watch that. I'm really hoping it's on tonight. If people don't know what I'm talking about, I think people, everyone knows what hippo lectures are. It's a monthly talk I give. But tonight it's snowing bonkers mad hard in Moscow right now. It's forecasted three to five inches. Our staff at Vandal Catholic is so wonderful. Despite all their expertise, what do you do with frozen pipes? So the normal dinner that we have that accompanies the stuff, we might try to order pizza. That <laughs> pizza's good though. <laughs> Pizza's positive. I'm hoping it's still on because I'd much rather, I mean, this is, whole, I mean, I, I, there's two people in class right now and it's just the two coolest people and it's awesome. It's way cooler to give a talk to 10, 20, 80 people than to do it in front of a computer. So I'm hoping it's on tonight. Um, I mean, Betsy, I'm actually going to give you a lot of credit though. You have something going on. You have a family obligation, but you didn't say outright no. That is so kind of you. You could be like, absolutely, you said probably no. If there is a chance. So you're like, you know what? I'm still going to, I don't know. Anyways, God bless you guys. Uh, until next time, next week we will cover, if I'm not mistaken, Mozart on Monday and then Bo Jackson on Wednesday. And then the following week, my favorite to date, certainly, we're going to talk about Ernest Hemingway. And if you're like, Hemingway Catholic, really? Yeah. Hemingway, by his own admission, was a bad Catholic, he says. I'm not judging him. But he's like, yeah, I'm not a good Catholic. And he was divorced a bunch of times and did a bunch of sketchy stuff. But again, there but by the grace of God go I. I'm not going to judge him. He's certainly an unbelievable. I think he's the greatest American writer of all time. And in kind of a legacy point, Hemingway funded a bunch of Catholic schools in the kind of Ketchum Sun Valley area where he died, which is pretty cool. I heard some of the Catholic, there might even be like an Ernest Hemingway school named after him in Ketchum. I mean, that's not surprising. Hemingway's is crazy famous. Hemingway, he's a Nobel Prize winner. I mean, obviously the name speaks for itself. Did you know there was an Abraham Lincoln school? Yeah, that probably, Hemingway is almost on that kind of caliber. But a lot of people don't know in all the legend of Hemingway and Cuba and cigars and the hunts and guns, you know, Hemingway was a Catholic. And in fact, really cool last point, chew on this. I want you guys to chew on this point as you quit. Hemingway said the thing that convinced him of the truth of Catholicism were the apparitions of Fatima. We're going to have a spirit in life later this semester where myself and our, our pastor, Father Chase, talk about Fatima. Are just apparitions. I'm probably going to focus on Fatima. Although, of course, you could do other ones. I'm probably going to focus on that one. Hemingway was born in 1899 and says, he's like, yeah, this proves to me the Catholic faith is true. I mean, this is incredible stuff. We'll save the story for Fatima when we talk about that. But like people know the story. Like, this is credible. Those guys who come out to see the miracle of the sun, even these secular guys, you're like, oh, yeah, I came out here to mock this. And now I'm in RCIA. Like, this is legit. So Hemingway, one of his main driving points, and how beautiful is that? Like maybe some people need those heavenly helps. Hopefully we can be all like the not doubting Thomas. Blessed are those who haven't seen and believed, but some people need to see stuff. And Hemingway, all his life, however bad of a Catholic he was, again, his words, not mine, was some kind of Catholic. So we'll talk about him too, shortcoming. Um, see you later. Take care.